Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's sort of halfway through the afternoon, so I hope everyone has lots of coffee and are uh, ready for a wonderful session with, with the panelists here. So I'm going to go from left to right to introduce them. Uh, to our left, we have Norm Persky, the global public sector lead at Palantir, the, uh, the tech giant. Uh, to his right, we have Camille Grand, the Assistant Secretary for Defense Investment at NATO. Uh, following on, we have Angela McLean, Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK's MOD. And here to my left, we have Serene Dakaru, Director of the European Satellite Center. So that's, uh, that's it. We're here to talk about tech, R&D, and the future. Wherever you look now, it doesn't need to be just defense. The technology, I mean, it seems a bit um, like a cliche, but it is part of our, all our lives. And AI, big data, and all these topics are going to be coming quite pertinent uh, for, the, for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, Angela, I'm going to turn to you first. There has been a, a supposition that Na the NATO countries are the best at this when it comes to tech and R&D, that they, you know, going back decades, they could, frankly, had the, the, the dominance on the technological side. Frankly, with some of the rise of some of the other act global actors, frankly, that can't, isn't really the, the case anymore. At least the NATO dominance is being challenged. How does the coalition uh, the, uh, maintain that level of technological edge, particularly when other actors around the world are investing, frankly, a lot of money in all of this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think one of the things we can do is really terrific technology scanning. So uh, looking out across really our widest innovation uh, environments. So that'll be our own government laboratories, our universities, the big businesses, and of course that whole ecosystem of small and medium-sized enterprises that have been such an engine for innovation recently. So finding new innovations in those arenas and then figuring out really good ways to pull them into use for uh, bolstering the security of, of our people. Uh, some of our governments have been doing this for a long time very well and others of us are learning how to do it. Uh, and I think there's really two important bits of cooperation amongst ourselves there. One is, I think, to learn from each other how to do really great tech scanning. And the other is, of course, if one of us finds some really fantastic innovation, uh, something that's good for protecting the security of my people, is good for securing the, the, uh, the security of, of everyone in NATO. Camille, I suppose it all comes down to co cooperation and coordination. Yes, it, uh, to Angela's point, you can't just keep it in, in your own silo. You have to work with others to, to bring these, these technologies to the fore. I think that from a NATO perspective, the challenge is a bit twofold. First of all, um, as the Angela was, was pointing at, uh, we are in an environment that is more competitive. Uh, the notion that NATO can take its uh, technological leadership for granted is probably no longer true in certain domains, and we have to sort of really focus to, to make sure that we don't lose a track of that, whether it's in specific technological domains, and we just heard the uh, Supreme Light Commander for Transformation uh, mentioning some of these, but, uh, but also more broadly, uh, what does uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the, the use of data, uh, mean for the alliance? So that's, that's one element, and on that, what we're trying to do is uh, to do two things. First of all, uh, internally, make our uh, work uh, uh, more focused on innovation and not lose sight of that. And from that perspective, uh, we have established just in the last few months an innovation board uh, chaired by the Deputy Secretary General and, and a, a small innovation unit which will try to look at what the allies are doing. Uh, this, the, the point about NATO is not uh, NATO suddenly becoming a multi-billion euro organization sp uh, spent on, on, on uh, science and technology, but to really make sure that we work together. And the second thing, which is uh, probably even more important, is how do we leverage everything that is happening within the, the alliance and in the broader sense, in, uh, of course, in our ministries of the defense of all 29 allies, but also in all the universities, the, the tech companies that are there, uh, which is a, a sort of massive untapped potential of, of uh, 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 science and technology that can help NATO stay at the edge, which is really the, the big issue there. And in a way, what it was, has been extremely interesting, and I've, I've seen that happening in some of the, the groups I'm chairing, is to see how allies can share their experience. And with one thing that is, I think, fascinating in the, this new environment, which is that some of the smallest allies by size uh, have a lot to bring to the table. This is not, no longer necessarily only a big nation debate. And this is something that has been truly fascinating for me. So, Serene, in your current role looking at, sort of at sort of the, the, the outer space and your previous role at NATO looking at cybersecurity in the cyber, cyber realm, 
does that chime with you? The idea that you know some of the smaller some of the smaller allies are bringing a lot to the table, and the the need to cooperate to make this work. I think the cooperation is is indeed uh, uh, the name of the game, and not uh, just among states. And uh, I agree that with the new technology that can have what is called uh, equalizing effect, uh, also. You know, different allies can play significant roles, but also cooperation with the uh, industry. Um, it was uh, mentioned this morning that uh, today's industry that is driving the innovation, not as in the previous century, the government, the, uh, in, uh, the defense sector. So um, it's key to, to have such uh, cooperation. I know NATO has uh, industry partnerships, uh, not just on the procurement side, but also on these uh, new technologies. I would also um, highlight that, since you mentioned the two domains, uh, I would say uh, in, in outer space and in cyberspace, or in the digital uh, space, uh, one can see a really technological gold rush with huge impact uh, upon everything that happens on, on Earth and our societies, but also upon uh, security. And we, 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 we need to have this uh, in mind. On the one hand, um, these spaces are huge enablers, for, including for our military planning for, for security. Um, and uh, you know, from Earth observation, uh, the, the domain that I'm now in, I can say we, we, can, we have a whole digital twin of the planet where we can uh, really analyze what's happening. But on the other hand, we should also see, uh, look at the, uh, at the vulnerabilities that uh, they, um, they imply and our reliance on, um, on this. So when we're saying uh, innovating the alliance is not just about employing the most innovative technologies into what we're doing, but also um, bringing innovation into the strategic thinking, the institutional built up, the planning, going beyond what I would call an analog hangover and moving forward in the digital world with the thinking with the uh, work ahead. No, I'm turning to you from an in industry perspective. It's quite strange to think that as much as the, the governments involved in NATO have uh, billions of dollars of budgets, but a lot of the, the tech innovation and frankly the money is coming from, from industry right now, both with yourselves and, and, and others. Where do you fit into this puzzle? Where You as a palantir, but also the industry itself, what could, do you bring to the table that maybe some of the governments can't? I mean, I think the, uh, there's a couple of, of, of pieces to this. The first is, I think innovating in this space is somewhat different than in the conventional space, right? A, 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 an AI model is never done in the way that a weapon system is done when you field it. And so industry, or especially the tech industry, is used to this conception of constant iteration and innovation and putting things into the field and then making them better over time. Um, and that's something that, honestly, traditional defense industry has not been great at. Um, and and a, so learning from how you actually do this in the field, how does this actually work, what, is, what implications does this have on how you procure and how you build programs is really important. Um, you know, but. I think you know, what we can bring to the table from industry is probably relatively straightforward. I, what's, what's interesting to me about right now, though, is where kind of Silicon Valley writ large is in this. And I, and I think right now Silicon Valley writ large is actually a, a really serious threat to the security of the West, honestly. Um, you look at things like Google pulling out of Project Maven, um, which is kind of the obvious thing where there's these... these so can you just explain what Project Maven is for those? So Project Maven is a, a, a U.S. Department of Defense project to kind of build an AI platform for imagery. Um, incredibly important when there's tremendous amounts of imagery data being generated and understanding what's going on in it. Um, and so you have in the U.S. ostensibly one of the, the companies that's best at, or should be best at this, uh, choosing to walk away from that program. Um, and, and this speaks to a larger, I think, cultural issue, which is, you know, if in... I think in the 80s, if you were to, to turn to a young engineering student at Imperial here and ask her if she you know, was, was willing to turn her technology and her mind to, to the defense of the nation, she'd probably say, of course. And I think if you asked that same question now, you'd get it probably considered, you know, oh, well, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to go make ads better somewhere. And I think that's culturally incredibly difficult. And I don't know that, that, that NATO or, honestly, that, that government quite understands what, what the divide is and is ready to bridge it. I find it striking that you say that, that maybe the valley right now is, is sort of not help, is, I think harming is the word you used, the, the, the sort of the, 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 uh, the NATO establishment when it comes to sort of this realm. That, that strikes me as sort of counterintuitive, right? But I mean, does it strike tr true with the other panelists that maybe the, the pulling back from some of the, the tech players, many of whom do have access to this technology, is that something that you have also felt in, in your work? 
I can't say it's something I've noticed, but then I'm very new. I was going to ask a different question, though, which is what can we do about it? I mean, I think clarity is, is, is really important. So I think um, not being clear on the ethics of what we're doing, uh, having an open conversation about it, about intention, is really important. Um, I think government has a role in, in providing good foundations. So instead of asking private industry to collect data, gov government can take that responsibility and provide really clear guidelines around how this is being used and then create these platforms where industry can innovate on top of. Uh, so rather than Google collecting healthcare data, you know, the NIH collect, can collect healthcare data and then provide that to industry to innovate on, uh, controlled well. So I think clarity is important, but then engaging in the public debate and discussion on what is the role of technology, of people in technology uh, in this space, especially when our adversaries look the way they look. I mean, in, in, with fully integra integrated kind of uh, between the political class, technical class, and, and uh, industry against the common goal, that's quite difficult to meet uh, when we look as splintered as we do. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think linked to this, we have to, to consider the importance of uh, uh, really investing in uh, um, building education uh, and bridging actually technology with uh, policy, uh, legal study, the ethics, um, and, 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 and so on. Um, because uh, otherwise, um, we are living in this uh, separate worlds and it, it would uh, uh, haunt us. So that's that's uh, number one issue of concern. The, the other aspect is uh, the importance of um, governments to be uh, involved in uh, looking on the, let's say, safety security uh, implications of the technologies um, upon um, societies, upon uh, people. Especially when I think about security, we have seen how new technologies are used by adversaries uh, with the kind of what, what was in the past, like carpet bombing effects. You know, uh, just hitting uh, at uh, innocent uh, civilians or non-prepared civilians with uh, um, uh, special uh, techniques, either in cyberspace, in the information uh, sphere, cognitive sphere with uh, artificial intelligence. So for this, uh, we need this combination of education, but also uh, taking some um, role of government and also uh, intergovernmental organizations. Mm -hmm. um, let me start with that sort of ethical debate. I think it's a major debate. Uh, but it can also be a sort of uh, uh, rabbit hole that we all jump into, especially those of us who are more political scientists or lawyers, which is the standard training of uh, diplomats and so on. So we, we sort of uh, immediately focus on that, which is even though it's absolutely essential to be firm on our values and to make sure that we have uh, 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 the right standards, uh, but I think it's important to, have, to, to really look at both sides of the coin uh, and, uh, and, and, and to, to be part of that conversation, to make clear that NATO or the EU for that matter intend to use technology in an ethical manner or, and that, but not to sort of jump to the, the you know, discard the technology, whether it's uh, autonomous uh, systems, whether it's uh, uh, the use of AI, uh, of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in, uh, as, as, a, as a threat immediately. Uh, and because we very quickly jump to the sort of a Terminator type of discussion, which is not completely helpful. The, but the second thing, which I think is extremely important, is in the, the engagement with the, the tech community. And I think, uh, Noam, you, you really uh, nailed it in saying, okay, how do we make sure that we, we can work together and that uh, both the tech giants and the, the, the startups are interested in working with institutions like ministries of defense or um, NATO for that matter. And, and there are the, I, I think that we have a, have a sort of a mixed experience. In some cases, you do get people who say, just no, I'm not interested anyways, I'm not making uh, good money and have uh, plenty of ways to make good money and secondly uh, uh, what you do is uh, not what I want to be involved in but on the other hand we do have lots of engagement I spoke at we, we have a couple of, of events uh, uh, in the NATO environment hosted by the NATO communication and information agency um, NITEC, NIAS, uh, sorry has been at those and you know it's kind of fun for me as a NATO official to be sitting in front of 5,000 people I'm the only guy with a tie who are interested in engaging with NATO and, and doing uh, stuff with us and, and getting uh, into uh, our world of, of, uh, uh, of, of contracts and things like that. So I think there is uh, lots of room and I think NATO has a, has a uh, sort of pretty good image in that context where it is interesting to engage. The last thing we need to find, and it's just one sentence, is to find the good ways to do it. 
because our processes can be uh, 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 damaging from that perspective because we, we don't like failure. We like to write the requirements and not to be agile in our engagement with industry and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's, I think that's where we need to do our homework. Mm -hmm. And I, I would venture uh, to say that yeah. the most important thing is, is access to real problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at what, what young people want, or people in technology, or what we as companies want, is access to the real problem. Give us that opportunity, not in a lab, not in an innovation hub, not in a corner somewhere. Um, and that's really the, the power that institutions like NATO have, is the ability to open up that access to real problems. And, and I completely agree. I think there are two things we can offer to, uh, to, to young people. One is this access to real life, really important problems, mm -hmm. actually more important than targeting advertisements. Uh, and the other is training. So there's a lot of people coming out of universities at the moment with a good science education, but they're not actually data scientists yet, or, and they're not, or they're not RF scientists, or they're not trained in cybersecurity. All of those are things that we need people who can do them. So I think we have a great opportunity to train people up in those things, maybe offer them a three-year graduate apprenticeship, something like that, and just know that afterwards they're going to leave. They're going to go off and work in our industry. Frankly, that's great because industry needs them too. Universities do this all the time. We call it a PhD studentship. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really great way to get all the energy and innovative thinking of somebody who's just come off a degree into working in science. And uh, it works for us. I think it could work really, really well uh, in, in defense, too. Sorry. If I, if I may just uh, one, uh, one other, uh, add one other issue. And this is the challenge that the new technologies bring to what I would call stability yeah. regimes. Uh, um, you know, previous uh, century was defined by uh, strategic deterrence, arms control, and so on and so forth. These new technologies make some of the previous experiences not so applicable. How do you do arms control for cyber weapons? You don't have the calibers. Uh, you cannot uh, judge them. You cannot even showcase them uh, in order to, to, to make the point. So I think um, it is important that um, especially nation states uh, look at the range of effects which such tools can produce and establish uh, or strengthen some, some rules of uh, responsible um, uh, behavior uh, and link it to international law, uh, see what is applicable. So from, um, uh, from this point of view, I, I know that uh, both EU and, and NATO, as a matter of fact, anchors everything that, uh, that is doing um, with the respect of international law and also establish this kind of values-based community that works together to develop these uh, future norms. Otherwise, we are going to be in the kind of uh, uh, continuous destabilizing um, uh, trend, and we, we need to stop this. But in a world of sort of move fast and break things, how, how do you do that at speed to make sure you keep up with the, the evolving technology th threat or opportunity while maintaining some of the, the, the safeguards that you mentioned? It, it seems very difficult to be able to push the, the boundaries but also sort of keep the legitimate controls in place. By being anchored uh, with the with the uh, different kind of uh, innovation hubs, uh, uh, trying to just have as much cross fertilization with the innovative uh, private sector uh, as possible at government level and also intergovernmental organizations level. That's the only uh, way, cross fertilization and at the same warp speed that the technology is uh, doing. I, I would say that we have to continue to change the way we do business on that, uh, meaning that it is, there are some ways of approaching this that are no longer efficient. Uh, you can't reasonably uh, turn to uh, some of the smarter companies in the world uh, to, uh, today and say, we've written for you a, a 20 page or 2,000 page requirement, uh, and uh, can you come up with the software that will fix that uh, I think the problem-solving approach, uh, the embedded uh, teams, the ability of working together, of bringing you know, the uh, operator in the military next to the uh, engineer at NATO, next to the, the, the company that can bring uh, the, uh, this together, is the way of addressing those challenges. It is very demanding because it, it touches upon very boring topics such as contracting rules and, and things like that. But on the other end, it's the best way. The good news is I think that most uh, of our allies have been working on this by establishing you know, innovation 
uh, uh, hubs, innovation uh, units, uh, which look also at people and processes, not only at science and technology, which is very important. And that's something that we're doing in the NATO environment more and more as well. Uh, uh, you know, I can praise the Allied Command for Transformation for really looking into this and trying to be, to be improving this. Of course, it is an ever, never-ending battle. It's, you know, you're never, you don't say, okay, I've changed one process, it's done. I think we, it's also changing a mindset, which is, uh, which is demanding and, 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 uh, and something that we need to do. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think to that context, what we see is when there is a flagship program, not an innovation hub, not a side thing, a flagship program where one decide, where they decide to procure in a different way and to really look at this from, a, from an outcome-based perspective instead. And honestly, the U.S. military, of all places, which you would maybe not expect to be the, the, the fastest at this, in the last, I think, about two, three years, we've seen a sea change in a willingness to look at, you know, we're not going to write requirements. We're basically going to, to spec out what we want the end result to be in terms of capability of the warfighter, mm -hmm. and then we, you have six months to prove it. Um, and then we're going to buy the thing that actually works best at the end of six months. And to actually do this at scale, again, not in a side show program, but hundreds of millions of dollars of money behind it, then companies like us get really, really interested in putting all of our, we're, we're good at taking risk, right? Um, but we want to do it under, under the right conditions and conditions like that work for us. If I may just give an example of what we're trying to do. And again, I hope it will succeed. We have a program which is called the Alliance Future Surveillance and Control, which is the successor to, you know, the flagship AWACS, AWACS uh, fleet, uh, you know, the, the, the big planes with a radar dome on, on top. Uh, and this is a 2035 capability, which is technically tomorrow. Uh, the way we are doing it right now in the concept stage is turning to industry and say, what smart ideas do you have? And we don't say it's going to be manned, unmanned, a swarm of capabilities, land-based, space-based, uh, air-based. We just say, what are the smart ideas that you have to propose? So we are exactly in, the, in that phase, and we are throwing not enormous amounts of money, but significant amounts of money into the, 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 both the, the traditional defense company, but also the tech companies to say, do you have a new smart approach to this? Uh, and interestingly, uh, and, and we open for competition, so we have multiple contracts on the same notion for this initial concept stage, which will then enable us to narrow the thing. The challenge is, of course, for the next phase to move into, mm -hmm. to continue that open spirit rather than, than sort of saying, okay, thank you, you've, you've just helped us write the requirement. I'm conscious of time, and we're going to open up to Q&A in a minute, so I see your hands go up, so we'll, we'll get to you in, in a second. Um, part of this seems to be a mentality shift. You, the idea you have to be more nimble, frankly, not something the defense industry or, frankly, governments have been quite known for in the past. Uh, and in your role as, sort of, as a scientific advisor to the UK's MOD, how do you put that in place? How do you get people to start thinking to the US government's example of trying to, okay, we'll give you six months, go hack away, and we might give you a contract? How do you change people's minds to, to get, start thinking in a different manner? So I think, as, as Noam described, we're actually quite good at doing it in little ways. And I think for us, the big challenge is how to find the daring to do it in a big way. Uh, and and I, I think we're, we're, we're taking a deep breath and gearing ourselves up to seeing if we could do that. Uh, because even in three months, I can see that we as a government department know that we have to change, which I think is always a big step. Knowing what it is you need to do is, is the first step to doing that thing. Um, laying the risk off to somebody else sounds great. <laughs> um, so, so given, uh, I think that would be a good way forward. And also embracing risk. You have the ability that, to use your example, after six months you might have spent some money and failed, right, but learned along the way. Um, so I believe there are individuals in the audience who have questions and there was uh, microphones. What I'm going to do is take a couple questions and then so we can get to as many as possible. We can go, um, this gentleman over here had his hand up first and then anyone on this side of the audience has a question. Okay, we're going to come to the lady over here. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Razin. I'm founder of Hydroco. It's a company focused on biotechnology and AI. Also, I'm also a student at the University of Glasgow. So my question is, um, how can the weaponization of AI, um, you know, as in like, you know, the rise of deep fakes disturb the peace in the world? And how can NATO um, encounter that as well as um, um, 
Another thing that I would like to ask is about Google's uh, quantum supremacy that got recently demonstrated. So how, how do we prepare for a post-quantum world? And in doing so, how could you also bring in emerging tech, um, technology um, uh, startup companies from emerging um, economies into the scene for NATO to work with? So these are my few questions. Great. Thank you. I guess three there. Before we go uh, to answers, have a quick thing. There's a lady over here. Could you just give us your name, where you're from, please? Thank you. Uh, Isabel Rocha with BSA Software Alliance, also here with a delegation from Women and in International Security. Um, I have a question relating between sort of the commercial area in which those companies operate and how they cater to specific needs from an organization like NATO. In a commercial area, companies are facing trends of protectionism where data has to be stored locally or they have to use um, local standards as opposed to global standards. They have to consider increasingly privacy, ethical considerations, not opining on whether this is good or bad, but this is just the reality in which they operate. I'm curious from the panelists' view, how does that impact, again, uh, how companies are able to cater to NATO's specific needs and if those are considerations that NATO is looking at as well in terms of how it plans future procurement. Thank you. Great, thank you. So let's start off with the first one, sort of how does NATO respond to deep fakes, I believe, just to paraphrase your question. Any, anyone want to take that? Uh, let me, first of all, um, we do recognize that as part of the sort of a, a battle domain is the information domain in many ways. Uh, we are confronted with more and more challenges uh, in this. And in a way, what used to be the role of our colleagues in uh, public diplomacy, uh, like organizing events like this one, is also to get a, a, a be constantly uh, aware of what's happening in this, in this era and how do we counter uh, disinformation campaigns, some of them based on deep fakes, and there, there are, you know, that we do need some, some tools to do that. And uh, this is something that is, uh, you know, there is a growing awareness, and now is how do we move from awareness to being actually able uh, to counter that and to uh, uh, recognize that there is uh, something ongoing or that there is a campaign that is uh, really, and of course NATO is uh, a, often a target on that. Uh, the second thing we, ca we can do as NATO is to look at, at uh, what, uh, you know, the setting the best norms and practice. It's interesting that in the cyber domain, the so-called Tallinn manual, which is recognized as the sort of uh, basic for good practice in cyber, was established in a NATO center of excellence. Uh, it is not a NATO approved document, but this, is, this was created in a, in a NATO environment. So from that perspective, it, you, you can see where when 29 nations work together, uh, uh, the, the experts from those multiple communities, they can emerge a norm that helps uh, addressing those new challenges coming from technology. Um, yes, I, I, just to, to follow up uh, on the same line, I think the, the, the best way is to, to really think that it's AI that can counter AIs, just like a network uh, counters a, uh, a network. And I, I can give you a couple of examples um, in my current job, and also previous one at, uh, at NATO, whereby uh, AI is already used as a huge uh, enabler, for example, in Earth observation to, to scan large surfaces, oceans, and so on, and really depict those elements uh, that are important, and this, uh, this is not done anymore by the human eye, it's done by artificial intelligence, and the human eye then focuses on the flag that appears in an uh, interest aspects, and that also, this gives anticipation um, uh, capacity, uh, so that uh, you're not looking for a needle in a haystack, uh, it's, it's the AI that finds the anomalies and anticipates trends. Uh, in cyber, in NATO, uh, there are so-called analytical uh, tools that the cyber threat assessment cell um, it uses uh, in order to depict uh, uh, the, the kinds of attacks, including the false flag attacks and, and so on. And I think also on, uh, in terms of uh, uh, fake news, NATO is a kind of platform of fact checking. checking in, uh, Sorry, in I'm going to have to stop you there. Um, I want to get through as many questions as possible, excuse me. To the lady's point over here about data localization, privacy, ethics, and how that, does NATO cater to that? I mean, so uh, looking at this from our perspective, uh, it is interesting to, to, to it, 
be part of the emerging discussion around national champions, even within NATO, uh, and, and in the same way that, that people were concerned about where, where the parts of the fighter jet are coming from, people are now concerned about where the, the AI models are coming from, um, and that's, that's kind of fascinating to see, and it, and it is definitely slowing things down. Um, we see the beginnings of kind of protectionism even within the different NATO countries around their national champions in each space. I would say in that space, what's interesting is to look at the speed at which the U.S. is, is able to operate. Um, because of the U.S. Gov cloud, and I know that this sounds like incredibly boring, but honestly, their investment in having a secret and top secret cloud infrastructure means that they can, small companies and interesting ideas can be deployed incredibly quickly versus a lot of the European states where this is incredibly unclear and getting something certified and operating on a network is, is incredibly tedious. And it seems like a technicality, but it definitely uh, sets the speed at which one can deploy innovation into these places. Same thing goes for privacy assessments and, and, uh, and other pieces. And, and the speed at which one can deploy new tech and learn if it works in the field is incredibly determinative of, of, of one's capability today. Angela? I want to grab the quantum computing question because that's such a great question. So what's it going to be like in a post-quantum computing world? Well, we all know that uh, our existing cryptography isn't going to work so well, and that's going to be tricky. But there's also just so many really, really exciting new bits of science that we're going to be able to do because there's a lot of computational work. Uh, I'm a computational biologist on Fridays. Um, there's, there, you know, there are so many things where we know what calculation we need to do, but we just can't do it because there isn't enough time. And I think particularly in computational chemistry, and also, I would say this, in computational biology, a whole swathe of things become possible uh, that simply haven't been possible up to now. Well, for us in defense, of course, we, we would think about um, materials and energetics, but then also about biologicals, so things that will uh, affect uh, uh, and, uh, well, for example, we'll make fantastic new kinds of therapeutics for people. I think if you think how far we've already come uh, in computational science, uh, it's impossible not to be tremendously excited uh, about what, you know, several, several orders of magnitude more computational capability is going to do for us. And for defence, that is exciting too. And one of the things we can do is put money into the bits that are really useful for us and by the standards of, of small, young bits of science, our money can make a huge amount of difference. I think on that very optimistic note, we have to call it a day. Uh, I'd like to round of applause to the panelists. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you.